Hi there, and welcome to the pre-class video for class seven. My name is Jason Harlow. Uh, today's video is on this supplemental reading, which is the introduction to uncertainty in physical measurements, written by me and my friend uh, David Harrison. It's nine pages long. Uh, it goes through uh, seven sections, which are shown up there. It's uh, introduction, the normal distribution, which is also called the Gaussian, uh, estimating the mean from a sample, <clears throat> reading uncertainty, significant figures, propagation of uncertainties, and the uncertainty in the mean. And the quote there above is that every time you make a measurement in a laboratory, you should report the value as well as the uncertainty in that value. And that's a quote from me, which is true. Okay, so almost every time you make a measurement, the result <clears throat> will not be an exact number, but actually a range of possible values. And you describe this range uh, with what's called the uncertainty. Uh, an exception to that rule would be um, if you have this pile of three apples, that's three, and there is no uncertainty on three. It's just three plus or minus zero. However, if you have a truck that's filled with apples and you say, oh, I think there's 1,600 apples in that back of that truck um, by estimating somehow based on the volume of the truck and the volume of an apple, uh, that number 1600 will have an uncertainty and it might be say a hundred depending on how carefully you count it. So we say 1600 is what's called the value and 100 is what's called the uncertainty. Uncertainties eliminate the need to report measurements with vague terms like approximately 1600 or this squiggly equal sign. It gives you a quantitative way of stating your confidence level in your measurement and what it means exactly is uh, it's if you say, for example, the value is 10, the uncertainty is 2, so 10 plus or minus 2 means that you're 68% confident that the actual number lies in this range between 8 and 12. Uh, it also implies that you're 95% confident that the actual range is within two of these error bars, so between 6 and 14 in this case. So, for example, if we were to make many measurements of the same thing, we could plot a histogram of the value we're measuring versus the number of times we make that measurement, if we make, take many thousands of measurements here. And the one sigma range encompasses 68% of those measurements that you make are within plus or minus one sigma of the mean whereas 95% of the measurements lie in this range, and only 5% outside that, plus or minus 2. So, okay, second section, normal distribution. A probability distribution curve <coughs> is, is what describes the probability for various measurements. It's that histogram we just showed. And the most popular and widely used distribution is called the normal distribution, also called the Gaussian, because it was first popularized by Carl Friedrich Gauss. Uh, sometimes it's called the bell curve because it is sh shaped a little bit like a bell. Uh, here's an, uh, a histogram of a measurements um, and a fit to that, which is a Gaussian fit. So it's, a, it's an idealized curve. Real histograms are often quite a lot more messier than that, but they can be approximated by a Gaussian. Uh, mathematically, it is uh, a times e to the power of negative x minus x bar squared over 2 sigma squared. Uh, a here is the amplitude, which doesn't really have much meaning, but it's just, just uh, the top of this curve. Uh, X with a bar on top is the average, or the mean, so the center of this. Uh, and sigma is the standard deviation of the distribution. So uh, sigma talks a little bit about the width. Sometimes you hear about uh, the variance of the normal distribution, uh, sigma squared. Um, larger sigma just means that the curve is wider okay? and you have, have more uncertainty every time you make a measurement. So in terms of integrating, 68% of the area under the Gaussian curve lies between uh, the mean minus one standard deviation and the mean plus one standard deviation and 95% of the area lies between plus or minus two sigma. So that's, that's where those probabilities come from. So let's say you make a bunch of measurements of the same quantity. They're all a little bit different. Uh, you expect your measurements to be normally distributed. Um, 
and you can maybe label your values of x that you measure with a little subscript i, so i x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, etc. You don't know what the true value is uh, because no measurement has infinite precision, but you can estimate it by adding up all the measurements you get and dividing by the number of measurements. That's just called the mean. So the estimated mean is this uh, sum of all your, the sum from i equals 1 to n of the x sub i, that means x1 plus x2 plus x3. Take all that and then divide it by n. You can also estimate the standard deviation of a sample of measurements. So same thing, you make a bunch of measurements of x, called x1, x2, x3. The best estimate of the standard deviation turns out to be this. First, you take each measurement and subtract it from the mean, which you already found in the previous step, and square it. And you do that n times, from i equals 1 to n. You take the differences of each, each measurement from the mean and square all those differences and add them all up. Then you divide by uh, 1 minus the number of measurements, sorry, m m measurement, number of measurements minus 1, and then you take the square root of all that. Uh, n minus 1 is what's called the number of degrees of freedom. It's the number of measurements minus 1. Uh, the reason you do minus 1 is because you actually used the estimated mean from the in the previous slide for uh, previous calculation uh, in order to find this. So that, that decreases this number of degrees of freedom and, uh, and gives you, this is the way to get a better estimate for standard deviation. So, uh, there is roughly a 68% chance that any measurement uh, of the sample taken at random will be within one standard deviation of the mean. So, uh, usually it's the mean is what we, we want to know, and each individual measurement will differ from the actual mean. Uh, so what we say is that for a particular measurement, you say the uncertainty in that measurement equals the standard deviation. This is often called a statistical uncertainty. So there's another kind of uncertainty called the reading uncertainty. So imagine I have a crayon, a green crayon as it turns out, and I want to measure its length. So I have, you can't see in this image, but I've lined up the bottom of the crayon with zero centimeters. Now we're staring at this point right here and trying to find uh, what that number is. It looks like it's a, a little more than 9.3, I might say 9.32, but what would you say is the uncertainty? Well, there's no fixed rule that allows us to answer this question. We have to use intuition and common sense. I mean, I don't think it's 9.4. 9.4 would be out here. It's clearly not that long. Could it be 9.35? It's a little blurry there to my eyes, but yeah, I think it could be. Could it actually just be 9.30? Yeah, maybe. So here's my range, 9.30 to 9.35. And a reasonable, reasonable estimate of the reading uncertainty would be half the range. So plus or minus 0.025. I might, to be cautious, round that up to 0.03. So then my original estimate was 9.32. I say uh, plus or minus my estimate of the uncertainty, 0 0.03 centimeters. And what I mean by that is that if a bunch of people went and tried to observe this crayon, about 68% of the time they would report a value in this range. So between uh, 9.29 centimeters and 9.35 centimeters. If you have a digital instrument, like this digital thermometer, which we've dipped into some sample and it says 12.8 uh, degrees Celsius, the reading uncertainty is usually one half the last digit. Um, and this is in the case where every time you measure it, you just get 12.8. You don't have um, a way of uh, figuring out standard deviation because you, you, you keep getting the same number. So what that means is it's one half of the, this, the power of 10 represented in the last digit. So in this case, it would be one half of 0.1 degrees Celsius, since that's the, you're looking at the 10th place there. So 0 0.05 degrees Celsius. So then, uh, <coughs> by our rules of significant figures, which I'll talk about later, you have to specify everything to the 100th place. So you'd say 12.80 plus or minus 0 0.05 degrees Celsius. So 
we had those we have two uncertainties now statistical which is the standard deviation and the reading uncertainty you may wonder which you should use well you always choose the larger to be your actual uncertainty uh, so for example if every time you measure something like with that digital thermometer you get the same answer then that means your statistical uncertainty is really small so just use the, the reading uncertainty However, if every time you take a measurement you get very different answers and the, they differ more than the reading uncertainty, then just forget about the reading uncertainty and use the standard deviation. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about significant figures. And these are slightly different rules than what's in your textbook, uh, but they're the real rules for when you have uncertainties. So imagine you have, let's say, 30 timing measurements uh, for which the statistical uncertainty is clearly dominant. And you take all those measurements and you use a, you find the mean, you use our equation to estimate the standard deviation, and you get 0 0.1029339 seconds. So let's say our, our fifth measurement was 5.49. Uh, if we use the sigma, or standard deviation, to be the uncertainty, well, then our measurement is 5.49 plus or minus this uncertainty. And what that means is that there's a 68% probability that we would have measured between this number minus the error and minus the uncertainty and plus the uncertainty. So this is our range. So here, this is just too many significant figures. It's really, in fact, a little dishonest to say that any of these numbers mean anything. The 6, 6, 0, 2, 9 don't really mean anything. Um, what we should do is, and it's much more kind of truthful, to just say there's about a 68% chance that the true value is somewhere between about 5.4 and about 5.6 seconds. So you would say 5.5 plus or minus 0.1. This is the correct way to write that, that measurement it is more honest than to put all these significant figures. So there's two rules in the significant figures and you apply the first one uh, tells you how to round off the uncertainty and the second rule tells you how to display the value. So rule number one is that you should only specify the uncertainty to one significant figure or maybe two. Two is actually more common. And then once you've got the error, so once you've got the uncertainty, the most precise column and the number for the uncertainty should also match the most precise column and the number for the value. So for example, if you specify the uncertainty to the hundredth place, then the value should be rounded to the hundredth place as well. Okay, propagation of uncertainties. When you have two or more quantities with known uncertainties, you might sometimes want to combine them to compute a derived number. So we're going to use the rules of uncertainty propagation to infer the uncertainty in the derived quantity. So, and in these rules, we're going to uh, assume we've got two numbers, x and y, that have uncertainties u sub x and u sub y, res respectively. And they're independent of each other, so one doesn't depend on the other. And we're going to sometimes use the fractional uncertainty u sub x over x and uh, u sub y over y. And it's good to keep in mind here that if x is a number which is clearly positive, like it's, if it's mass or something, then we're making the assumption that the normal distribution can apply. And in that case, the uncertainty uh, has to be much less than the value itself to, to, to kind of exclude the zero. So it's sort of... Uh, a little note there. Okay, so here's the rules. Uh, rule number one is if you're adding or subtracting x and y to give a new value uh, z, then the uncertainty in z is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares of the uncertainties of x and y. That's called the sum or difference rule. The product or division rule is that if you either multiply x times y or divide x uh, divided by y to give a quantity z, then the uncertainty in z divided by z, or the fractional uncertainty in z, equals the square root of the squares, the sum of the squares of the fractional uncertainties in x and, and y. 
Uh, and then rule two, 2 2.1, I guess, would be called the multiply by exact constant rule. So if you're multiplying x times y, where x is now an exact number, so that uh, u sub x equals 0, then uh, u sub z is just the absolute value of x times u sub y. Uh, and lastly, rule number three is called the exponent rule. So if you're taking just a number x, which has an uncertainty, and raising it to the power n, uh, where n is some, I guess, integer, it's, it's known precisely, then the fractional uncertainty in, in z equals x to the power n is equal to n times the fractional uncertainty in x. So let's do an example of how to use these. So let's just say we're in a lab and we're using a microscope to determine the number of microbe colonies in a Petri dish. And we have some fancy technique which gives us uh, a measurement of 2,700 colonies in the whole dish. And we're thinking we've probably got an uncertainty of about 10%. So I would say 2,700 plus or minus 270. So then a half an hour later, you do the same count, but now you get 3,600, again with this 10% uncertainty. And the counting process itself takes a little while, so the time between the two measurements, you estimate it to be 30 minutes, plus or minus 5 minutes. And you're asked to, to report what the growth rate is in this Petri dish in number of colonies per minute. So how do you do that? Well, we start by looking at the rate equation. It's delta n over t. So the delta n there is actually n2 minus n1. So in our case, that's 3600 is n2, and minus 2700, uh, that equals uh, 900 colonies. That's how many colonies grew. So we'll use rule number one, this, the difference rule, to find the uncertainty in that. It's going to be un uncertainty in n2 squared plus the uncertainty in n1 squared, all square root. So that's 360 squared plus 270 squared square root. On my calculator, I got 450. So the delta N is 900 plus or minus 450. That's how many grew, I guess. And then uh, we have to divide by T. So 900 divided by 30 is 30 colonies per minute. That's the rate. We'll use rule number two now, which is the, I guess, the division rule. Uh, fractional uncertainty in R is equal to uh, square root of the fractional uncertainty in delta N squared plus the fractional uncertainty in T squared. So I'm going to multiply uh, both sides by R, 30, times the square root of 450 over 900 squared plus uh, 5 over 30 squared. Do, plugging all that into my calculator, I just got 16. So the rate is four f uh, 30 plus or minus 16 colonies per minute. Okay, final slide, the uncertainty in the mean. So, a mean is when you take a bunch of measurements of the same thing and take their average, right? So, if you have n measurements, and every time you make the measurement you get the same uncertainty, we'll call that u sub x, uh, you can use the, use the un rules of uncertainty propagation to show this equation, which is that the uncertainty in the mean this little bar is telling you you've got the mean, is equal to the uncertainty in any individual measurement divided by the square root of n. So what that means is that you take a bunch of measurements, uh, like say uh, they all have an error of uh, one second, okay? Uh, if you take a hundred measurements and take the mean of all those measurements, then your uncertainty in each measurement is still one second, but the uncertainty in the mean is a tenth of a second. Okay, so that's why we take lots of measurements and then uh, take the mean, is because the uncertainty uh, gets less uh, as one over the square root of the number of times you make the measure measurement. So that's it for today. Uh, thanks for watching, and I will see you in class.